Welcome back to this third segment of this public law law session in relation to royal prerogative. Immediately before the break, I said that we would come back and we'll go straight into considering the issue of prerogative powers. And in particular, I think one of the interesting things that most people will be more or less aware of is the Iraq war and how does uh, and the idea of, of course, uh, England going to, to war uh, in relation to the Iraq war. What was the issue uh, in relation to prerogative powers? Well, the point here, of course, is that we see that the government of the day, and again, please do not mix up your government with your parliament. I know that most people who are within a parliamentary democracy will see the legislature and the cabinet uh, and the prime minister sitting in as part and parcel of parliament, but you need to make sure that you have that separation in your head. The idea, of course, is that we get the prime minister and the cabinet ministers, a decision is made, we are going to go to war with Iraq. Uh, this was not something that went before uh, the um, the parliament. It was not something that went before the legislature. So the idea then is, when you look at certain types of prerogative powers, as we flagged up before, when it comes to the two areas that uh, prerogative powers come under, domestic and foreign, well, you can go on the world stage if you are the Prime Minister of England and sign a treaty. You do so as the government. You don't do so as parliament. It still has to come back to England and then be made into law within the land. Equally, you can declare war. That's a prerogative power, which is exercised by the prime minister uh, through his office. So the point here was that when Britain, for all intents and purposes, went to war, it wasn't the people, it wasn't parliament that made that decision. Rather, it was the uh, prime minister and his cabinet, as it were. Because remember that with cabinet, and when we look at collective ministerial responsibility, a concept we would have touched on in uh, another law session, you will know that with collective ministerial responsibility, it does provide that if you're a cabinet member, you can't, of course, come out and say, well, I'm not in agreement with it. If it is that you're not, you must resign because your position has become untenable. And what we did see, of course, is around the time, there were a couple of people who did resign. People like uh, Robin Cook and Claire Short felt that they could not stand by uh, and still be part of the uh, cabinet and say, well, yes, uh, we're in agreement with this. If it is that you have that sort of conflict, well, certainly, you, certainly you'd have to leave and then become a backbencher. But the point is that it was prerogative powers invoked in order to go to war because that prerogative power to declare war belongs to the crown. What we did see and uh, what I will certainly finish off when we come to the last segment is looking at the impact for contemporary society. What is the point of prerogative powers? Are they tenable? Can you still consider these to be important in this day and age? Should it be that the prime minister effectively can go to war with another state without parliament agreeing to it. That is the thing to decide. Now, we have seen certain legislation come on board, but again, it appears to have been a little bit of a missed opportunity because certainly we see that these, uh, some of these issues were not addressed, albeit that these were the questions which led up to the legislation being enacted. And I'm, of course, talking about the Constitutional and Governance Act 2010 is that when you look at the uh, legislation, the idea was that you had a bill, the Constitutional Reform and Governance Bill going through, but we see that a lot of the things weren't taken on board. Now, if we go back to looking at the monarch and this idea of the prerogative power, the idea is that the monarch is above the law and therefore has crown immunity. Now, the legal immunity which is conferred by the royal prerogative may of course extend to institutions and servants of the crown. And of course, cabinet ministers may at times try to use crown immunity to avoid, for example, the release of parliamentary documents as they are servants of the crown. This of course remains an issue that some lawyers continue to discuss and analyze. Can ministers of the government use prerogative powers to stop an investigation into the work that they do uh, in respect of certain issues. Now, this has certainly led to some questionable 
uh, situations happening. And so, for example, when one looks at uh, this whole idea of, of the immun immunity, uh, it raises to mind public interest immunity. And in public interest immunity, uh, called PII for short, we do see that the government may claim that, for example, uh, a particular document ought not to be released precisely because it is of some public interest, uh, uh, which would, of course, be compromised and so immunity ought to be granted. And we see uh, a very sad situation, and again, I would urge you to read the law, your law text for this, is the case of Matrix Churchill, where PII, public interest immunity, was uh, being drawn on in respect of uh, uh, so the arms to Iraq affair, uh, and what it ended up being was that in the resulting um, uh, inquiry that was raised, we see what appeared to be the government's willingness to let two innocent men go to prison after they had clearly given them permission to do certain activities. It is a Matrix Churchill trial, M-A-T-R-I-X, Churchill, like in Winston Churchill. Have a look at it because it is an interesting uh, uh, situation where we see uh, one of the difficulties of this particular concept. Now, what has, when we look at contemporary society, what are the challenges to the royal prerogative? Well, we see the former Labour MP Tony Benn saying that they ought to be abolished and things which are so important, such important decis decisions, he said, should not be left to the crown, uh, i.e. to the prime minister and his cabinet, but rather should be subject to parliamentary scrutiny. Now, in relation to the war in Iraq, ministers were given a vote on whether Br Britain should participate, but the result was only advisory. It was not binding. So it didn't matter that the ministers were allowed to, to, to say, well, do you want to or don't you want to? Fact of the matter is that when you're looking at it, prime minister remains the first among equals. It is going to be what the prime minister says. Now, can we see a restriction of these powers in future? Well, the government has said as uh, that prerogative powers, uh, new ones cannot be invented, but some, as we have also seen, become redundant. Some of them have been diluted. And certainly when we look at some new legislation or indeed judicial review, we do see that some cases uh, have allowed uh, a, 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 a dilution of the prerogative powers. Now, in February 2005, the then Home Secretary Charles Clark did use royal prerogative powers to stop two British men who were freed from Guantanamo Bay from being issued with passports. Remember that the issuance of passports is a prerogative power. You don't get it as of right. That is not to say your citizenship is taken away. That's not the point. You still have your citizenship. You just can't get a passport. So that decision meant that the two men, Martin Mubanga and Feroz Abbasi, were effectively confined to Britain, but their citizenship was not affected. Now, as I keep repeating, the Crown cannot invent new prerogatives. And this, of course, is consistent with the residual nature of the prerogative powers itself. However, because the prerogative is not codified or it is not frozen at a particular point in time, you can, of course, use it to extend, to adapt it, to change circumstances. So there is scope for a court to identify a prerogative power which had little previous recognition and to use it. I'm going to take you back to the case again of the Crown against Secretary of State for the Home Department, ex parte Northumbria Police Authority, because the Court of Appeal examined the interaction between a known prerogative power and prerogative powers that might exist. Now, the facts were that the Home Secretary's power to issue baton rounds, as I said earlier, to a chief constable without the consent of the police authority was what was under review. Now, the court said that the Police Act of 1964 gave the Home Secretary the power to do this, but went on to say that in any event, the Crown still had a prerogative power to keep the peace within the realm, which was not displaced by the 1964 Act, and the Home Secretary could therefore have acted even if the Act had not provided him with that power. 
Now, in the case, interesting, interestingly, Law Justice Nurse commented that the scarcity, the scarcity of reference in the books, meaning the law books, to the prerogative of keeping the peace within the realm does not disprove that it exists. Rather, it may point to an unspoken assumption that it does exist. A very circular argument. He's pretty much saying, just because it's not written anywhere does not mean it doesn't exist. In fact, the fact that it doesn't, it isn't written anywhere actually means, or may very well mean, that it does exist. Interesting. It's kind of like saying the fact that Jennifer, there's nothing written anywhere that Jennifer Housen should be getting free money from the government doesn't mean that I shouldn't be getting free money from the government. In fact, the fact that it's not written that I shouldn't be getting free money from the government actually goes to show that maybe there's an assumption that I should be getting it. I am not sure personally that I completely agree with Lord Justice Nurse. Understand where he's going with that, but it does seem a little bit uh, self-serving, frankly. Um, but that is for what? That is for you, the law students. That's for the things you need to decide and what you need to consider when you're writing your paper. Okay, so we've got these prerogative powers. Do they just work willy-nilly? Do, do they just work without anybody keeping them in check or keeping a checks and balances on them? How do you control prerogative powers? Well, the exercise of prerogative power is subject to checks and balances, not least by Parliament and the courts. Again, I would refer you to the separation of uh, uh the separation of powers uh, law session because we did make some inroads into that in that law session. Well, if we look at, first of all, how are the prerogative powers limited in respect of parliament? Well, it has long been established uh, that parliament can override and displace the prerogative by statute. There's no question about that whatsoever. Equally, when you look at prerogative powers in relation to the court, we do see that the court has a little bit more difficulty because as I uh, said earlier, the court can of course look at, does the prerogative power exist? If it does, what kind is it? If it is high policy, they can't touch it. But if it is that it has to do with civil liberties, and uh, uh, rights, then arguably they can, of course, consider it through the courts. We're going to take another short break. And as I come back into the final segment, we will, of course, wrap up this area of uh, 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 the, the, this area. And certainly we will continue, of course, with the royal prerogative to consider how it is controlled and what the contemporary issues, for example, new legislation, how is it now being dealt with? So we shall continue with royal prerogative immediately after this break. <music> 